There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Well, it's another episode of Word in Your Attic, where, and this is terrific, we are joined by actor, comedian, writer, and maker of, I think, 10 attractively psychedelic albums, the great Matt Berry. Matt, welcome. Lovely to Thank see you. Thank you very much. In what Sorry appears to be a home off. studio, is that right? I am in my studio, yeah. And like I say, I'm sorry it's taken so long to do this. Um, but yeah, we're here now. And yeah, doing... we were going to do something in May, I think, but some filming came up. What would, uh, is that something you can discuss, the filming? No, it is. I was about to start filming, and I did, uh, Toast of Tinseltown, which I finished last week. And in a week's time, I'm going to be going off to Canada to do another What We Do in the Shadows. So this is a good time. Good, good. Brilliant. We're loving the what appears to be very 60s cushions uh, uh, attached to... Two baffles. Attached to the ceiling type thing. Fantastic. That's great. Well, look, where we traditionally start is back at the parental home yeah. when you were young. Yeah. With memories of, um, you know, the first record playing equipment that you had and what was being played on it. Can you remember? Where was this, yeah. in fact? Is this, is this Bedfordshire? This was, in, this was in Bedford, yeah. Where you still are now, I think. Uh, sometimes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I can remember it all very clearly because it's so they had a they had a record player which was perched above the TV on a shelf that my dad made. But the thing is, the only records that they had were a Gladys Knight and the Pips album, which they never played, and a Status Quo album, which they never played. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing, and the only other thing that he had was so they played dad. nothing. They played nothing at any time. The only other thing that they had that my dad had was a cassette of sporting bloopers, which he played <laughs> car. So that was that was the sum total of my parents' record collection: a tape of sporting bloody bloopers. Is this com commentary bloopers, presumably? Yeah, think, yeah. That what kind of things? That bloody that, that thing where the um, um, the cricketers um, and the bowl the bowlers holding the bowlers holding the bowlers with Willie. That's right, yeah, <laughs> and all that stuff. There's only so many times you can listen to that, and it's <laughs> hilarious. You know, it's not that small, I don't think, but you know, it was something that he was into, and yeah, right. So, so when did you first start getting interested in music? Um. In the rare times that in between playing that tape, he <laughs> or my mum would sort of inadvertently play the radio. And yeah, and it would be, this would be the late seventies. So my memory is lots of, lots of ABBA right. was on the radio then. And that made a huge impression because I knew it was pop music and I knew it was meant to be kind of, you know, sort of kind of happy because I'd seen it the night before on top of the pops. But it all sounded sad. And as a, you know, as a kid, that didn't make much sense, but was, you know, at the same time, intriguing. And I still feel that way about the band now. There, there's just something that's just an element, you know, whether it's the sixth court, you know, or whatever it is that they do. But there's this kind of hint of sadness about all of their most sort of cheery pop songs. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was like a six-year-old that kind of sticks with you because, you know, you just want to hear, you know, sort of happy things, you know, and things that, you know, that your mum and dad like, you know, and your brother and your sister or whatever. But, yeah, that was like my earliest kind of memory of any kind of music. That and um, I remember Gary Newman on Top of the Pops. He had blue hair. Yeah. And I thought that was extraordinary. But the most sort of potent memory of Top of the Pops was was Kate Bush doing um, Wuthering Heights. And I've mentioned this before, but... How old would you have been then? I, I think I was five or six. So Kate Bush, unsettling, surely, at that time. Well, what, what she did, and I didn't... I obviously didn't understand it at the time, but I've watched it back since, and it all makes sense. She looked directly down the camera. Yeah. 
which I know that kids TV presenters, you know, are told to not do for too long. You don't oh, want to they? Fix, well, that's I th it's, it's some kind of rule like that. You don't want to be staring oh, really? right at kids sort of seriously for any length of time, apparently, because it kind of frightens them. Yeah. And um, that's exactly what she did the whole way through that performance. And I remember it, it, as a kid having these, you know, conflicting emotions as to was she the most beautiful woman I've ever seen and the most scariest, at, you know, at the same time. But did that make you want to investigate her music or did it just terrify you? Make you well, run I, I didn't understand that she was, you know, that she was a musician. When you're that age, Top of the Pops, you don't think about Top of the Pops like that, I don't think. You just think about it as a bunch of colourful kind of performances, some which you would remember and some which you don't. Do you know what I mean? I didn't yeah. realize, you know that there was, you know, a competition for the top, you know, the best mm. single. You know, that I wouldn't have cared about that. It was just, you know, all the different, you know, it's kind of, I've heard sort of people talk about, you know, when they saw Sparks, you know, and that, you know, and what the brother was doing. And it's the same kind of thing. You know, if someone does something which is um, extraordinary or, you know, sort of odd when you're a kid, you know, you sort of remember that forever. So, Wendy, can you remember when you first bought a record? Well, my mum bought me Prince Charming by Adam and the Ants. Right. Because um, I liked him because, you know, he was very colourful and he had the thing across his nose, which, you know, kids like that sort of thing, I think. Right, right. And so, so where would those records be, have been bought then? What, what Can you remember the record shops? Woolworths. They'd have been bought in Woolworths, not in any cool record shop or anything cool. like that. They'd have been yeah. bought... They'd have been bought at the same place where mum would have bought everything else for the house. Yeah. It just would have been, you know, on our way to get this. There's some, you know, there's some, there's some records. He liked this one or he d dances to this one. So let's get this. Right. <laughs> so what about when you got a bit older? Did you, did you start to uh, you know, develop standard teenage tastes or not? Well, yeah, but it was a, it was a good time because the mid eighties, you know, it wasn't like you'd had sort of 10 years before where if you'd have had a prog album, you know, in your HMV bag, you know, with the Sex Pistols album, you know, that, that, you know, that would have sort of confused all of your friends, you know, and you'd have had to have explained yourself and all this kind of stuff. But then, you know, 10 years later, you could have any album in your bag, you know, which you bought, you know, which I, um, so the most significant one is, and it still is, was this, which I got when right. I was 14. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. So you got that. How old were you, 14? I was 14, yeah. So you bought it 10 years after it came out, presumably, round about. Yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't have known yet. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't have realised that. But yeah. Yeah. So did you know the story? Because when, when that came out, well, we, we, you know, we, we, at the time, everyone was aware of the story of how old he was and how he'd made the record himself. and played. No, well, I found did you realise all that at the time? No, no, I did after I sort of listened to it and kind of looked into it. But at the time, in 1984, or, you know, or no, a bit later, in sort of 1986, that wasn't... A, <laughs> Particularly, you know, current album to be sort of. Speaking. It was. It wasn't vogue. <laughs> it wasn't vogue at all. It like really that. wasn't. No one else, you know, there was no one else in my class who had that. So, <laughs> so this is a very I solitary experience, is it? Because pop music at that age, you're meant to be getting together with all your mates and listening to it and dancing. Yeah. This is you in your bedroom on your own, right. listening yeah. to Mike Oldfield. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And at that time, it was quite. A, it was a very sort of significant album because at that time, I had an organ in my room and a very basic four, four track sort of cassette recorder. Oh, and I nice. was, and I'd already started sort of making my own, my own awful songs as you do, you know, when you get your first little four track. And, um, and then I found out, you know, that he was like 17 when he'd recorded, you know, not only recorded that, you know, but played all, all of, you know, all of the instruments. And that was only a few years older than what I was, you know, when I first sort of listened to it. So I knew I had to, you know, get my shit together, so to speak, and, uh, you know, do something, <laughs> basically. 
So you hadn't been in a band or anything like this. You were just you were just playing. Yeah, it was on just your own. no, because there wasn't much interest. Like you know, there was I don't know. It was just whether it was the school that I was at. No one was really bothered about you know sort of playing anything. So I just recorded the organ, then do you know? Then I'd like do a bass part on it and just build it up like that. And I kind of learned that way just by doing it on my own and getting a lot of stuff wrong you know, and mm-hmm. making loads of mistakes and things sounding awful, you know, before you finally start to know what you're doing, which, you know, takes and a while. But if you were principally a keyboard player, were you, were you kind of looking at other keyboard players all the time? Were you going, that's Jean-Michel Jarre, that's Rick Waitman or whatever? Yeah, yeah. I that's mean, Jarre was a huge... John Lord. Yeah, but it was because of that that I then had to buy a bass guitar and um, all the other instruments because there wasn't anyone else to sort of play them. So... Um, you know, I had to learn the bass. You know, it wasn't to be sort of flash or anything. It was because there was no one else, you know. So, you know, I didn't have a choice. So I learned, you know, but I loved I loved doing it. You know, once I sort of did it, you know, it was like, well, this is great. And then the six string, you know, and then the drums, you know. And So this is recording your own compositions then? Yeah. Can you remember any song titles? No, no I, the, there's one called Igneous, as in Igneous Rock. All <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would rather die than listen back. I mean, it, but, you know, I know what kind of thing it, it would have been. It would have been in long form. So, it, you know, it would have lasted 15 minutes and would have been in, you know, a number of badly played sort of segments. In our sections, yeah. <laughs> this is fantastically against the grain. Just a soul <laughs> teenager <laughs> making 15-minute compositions in their attic yeah. at the time when all this stuff was going on in the mid-80s. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I Did know. you ever play this stuff to anybody? I I played it to my uncle, you know, and some friends, but you know, I I wasn't that confident of it back then. Um, so it was kind of more about just getting it right for you know for myself. I just wanted it to sound sort of authentic, you know, like whoever that is that's playing the bass guitar half knows what he's doing you know whoever that keyboard is must you know it, it was as if everything kind of had to sound right i was more interested in that to begin with and so, so do you, when you you're a teenager did you when you looked at the future do you think i'd like to be a musician when i grow up kind of thing is that i, I wouldn't have thought i mean i i knew what i didn't i knew what i didn't want to do and that's always been the case um that was a stronger, stronger force within me than having any kind of clear idea. I mean, you know, I knew that I wanted to work in the arts, but I would have been, you know, c- completely content if that would have been um, performing, painting, you know, or doing sort of music. Either of those things would have been, you know, a win-win for me. Right. There's a lovely kind of psychedelic tone to a lot of the stuff you do so where did that where did that come from where, 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 who were the groups the musicians that you were looking at together well i just like anything that had like wet sounds you know anything that kind of sounded like part of it was recorded underwater because i wouldn't have known what to call these things back then yeah you know, I don't know what a, you know what a bloody flange pedal was or anything yeah like that. um you know it just all sounded like you know it had been the stereo gun you know had like gone under the swimming pool and then come back and I just wanted to do that, you know, I wanted to learn how that was done. And these wet sounds that kind of took you out of the normality of sort of normal two minute pop music, you know, the kind of sounds that you don't really, you know, don't really hear on the radio back then, you know, the top, top 10 stuff. Right. Did you listen to the radio and things like that in those days? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and there there would be the odd thing, but the guitars were never loud enough for me, and there wasn't enough wet sounding. <laughs> <laughs> you were hard to please. <laughs> There's no I'm doubt about it. I like you know, I like melodies, you know, I like you know, I like I like melodies, but I just couldn't understand why you'd had this stuff, these Roxy music albums and this Bowie stuff, you know, which kind of had these amazing sounds. I just didn't understand why all that had been kind of dropped. Uh-huh. Ten, year, 10 years, you know, sort of 10 years later. Um, right. I couldn't have, you know, I couldn't have worded it like that back then. But, you know, that was what I was kind of thinking. Did you read the music papers? 
Yeah, I mean, um, I did more when I went to university because that's when the whole sort of Britpop thing happened, early 90s. That's when I started to read those. I couldn't have afforded them before. Um, Can you remember the first group you saw? The first, yeah. Uh, the first person I ever saw was Jean-Michel Jarre. <laughs> God, I see, that's... At that's where? Uh, that's precocious, too, isn't it? In 1988. How the first gig you saw, how astonishing! Yeah, and I got the program. Oh wow! Let's see where it is. Oh so, wow! And where was that? That's Docklands. That was when he was doing his show at with the projected the backdrop of yes. yeah. Yeah, 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 oxygen, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, I thought it was incredible. Well, I mean, I had nothing, you know, to com you know to compare it to. Um, yeah, I was just kind of lucky, you know, that he was doing that, at, you know, at that time. But this was kind of open air, wasn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah. it was cityscape kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I saw him do this in Houston, to Texas. Dad. Sorry, say that again. Sorry. I was saying I was too young to go on my own. I had to go with a mate's dad. Like, it was, yeah. <laughs> so what were you just perched on a car bonnet or something like pretty, that, looking at this? Pretty much, yeah. It was, you know, it was in that, it was before it was all kind of done up. Um, yes, it would be, yes. And... <laughs> And look very different, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, it was just like a bunch of it was just like a bunch of people in like a Costco car park, right? Um, looking at some structure in the distance. With yeah, some far things. away. Yes. You know, when you kind of break it down like that now, it sounds <laughs> punny, but you know, yeah, with, with, with no lyrics, I don't think <laughs> it's entirely <laughs> instrumental evening. Christ. It's the least yeah. typical musical experience it you is. can possibly imagine. That, that is. is so unusual. You go and look at a city in the distance couldn't and you listen to music. Away from the, yeah, I could have been further away from the artist. I had no idea it, whether he had a detail. He could have been back in Paris for all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what did they do? But you were excited by it, obviously. I thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. I had nothing to compare it to. I'd come from some little town and then to come up to London and to see this and to kind of hear all these synths and stuff. You know, I, I, you know, I, I was easily pleased back then. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I thought it was fantastic. So when you went to university, did you, were you in band there or? Well, like yeah, I mean, everybody was. Um, I was doing an arts course, so everybody was in a band um, when they weren't sort of painting and whatever. Um, and it was just as it was actually 27 years ago, because it was when the first Oasis album came out, because we can all, you know, because I still, you know, I'm still in contact with um, a lot of the people I was at college with. Uh -huh. um, you know, we can all kind of remember that because every single um because I, I was in halls of residence like most people were in the first year and every single floor had that album on and you know that album was the album that everybody you know was kind of playing uh-huh um really important which, which album are you talking about it's the uh, first, 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 first you know, ways. yeah 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 did right. you go and see uh, any of those uh, pop bands as a consequence though yeah i did i was very yeah because it was because it was a fantastic time i mean i was very i was very lucky because I got to see them at Earl's Court on the 5th of November, 95, to then come back to Nottingham on the 6th um, to see Radiohead at um, Rock City. So it was like two massive, important gigs, one after the yeah. other. Um, pure luck, you know, but I'm so, you know, kind of thankful for that. And... Uh. Nottingham was fantastic because, I mean, obviously every band would kind of come through. So it would literally be around that time. It would be, are we going to go and see Pulp or are we going to go to this disco? I mean, you know, it was kind of like that, you know, are we going to go and see Supergrass, you know, or shall we go to this? We were so spoiled, you know, that there was like a sort of choice every single week. Right. Loved right. it. Yeah. Have you, you got a few souvenirs of your music, early music making activity here, have you? I do, yeah. What have you got? So this is the first keyboard I ever had. <laughs> oh my God, I can remember those. <laughs> that was Incredible. Yeah, that was a, uh, a Christmas present from 1982 or something, 1981. And that's that's presumably um, you just play one note at a time, can you? Yeah. On that? 
yeah, yeah, so it's, it's monophonic. But it's, it's monoph- very important because it sounds it sort of sounded great. And they had little pre-programmed. We had one of those. A little pre-programmed um, rhythm tracks on it, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed like the future, didn't it? Well, it was. Kind well, of yeah, thing. it was. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, you could be your own band. You know, you've got your skin <laughs> and stuff. You know, you play over it. You know, you can sing. It's spot on. Do you ever use it still? I guess you probably do. Well, because lo- it's so nice to those little yeah, retro it sounds. On something. I, I actually heard one of the beats on something quite quite recently. Because yeah. the beats are retro sounding now. You know, so lots of people sort of have kind of used them. But yeah, you know, that you know, I would completely put that in some. <laughs> yeah. What else have you got there? Have you got any other old uh, bits of kit? Yeah, so I managed to find um, two tapes from mate's dad's cars that I never gave back. <laughs> oh, God. What is that? Jimmy, H- is that Jimmy Hendrix smash hits? I'm trying to see that. Yeah, and yes, it uh, is. Fleetwood Max greatest hits. Fantastic. <laughs> These are obviously someone's dad's you know yeah 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 (laughs) so they were just in the back seat of the car i didn't have any tapes can i borrow these sort of thing yeah 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 you know make sure you bring them back absolutely (laughs) (laughs) well if they're watching (laughs) (laughs) you were all you were keen on tv themes yes well, yeah. you made an album, didn't you? You made, made an album, album TV. Yeah. Very good. So yeah. that's a, are you being served? Yeah, that was done purely for the reason that you can't get those things. It's like, because what we originally wanted to do at Acid Jazz was try and get the license for all of those things and put them out. Um, but they just didn't, you know, exist anywhere. Like, I got in touch with the the lady who did the sorry theme she didn't know where the tapes were you know all this kind oh, of really stuff. the world in action stuff no one knows where that is uh it was a real ball like you know to try and find all these things so in the end just thought you know well you know i could kind of re you know re you know sort of recreate and if it works it works if it doesn't because you did that I, mean, I was i was listening to it the other day and you did this one of uh, are you being served and you just take the basic theme and then you go to go into an improvisation aren't you i mean it's kind of two and a yeah. half minutes long or whatever well, so you're you're, you're, you're inventing like, a song based on that idea yeah. yeah 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 because otherwise that album would have been sort of 15 minutes long <clears throat> Those things are very, very short. So yes. I come up with something, you know, in the middle of them all, just to make it, you know, like a decent kind of length. So they all go kind of psychedelic in the middle, then back to where, you know, they sort of normally should go. But I've got another um, thing to show you. Which go on. Go on. Right. So for the 50th year in the business, I went over to Paris to do Jean-Michel Jarre's sort of podcast in interview thing. I'd never done anything like that before. I was really honored to be asked because I have no experience of interviewing anyone. Um, So I went and did that and he took me into his studio and there were all the bits of kit that he'd used for oxygen. And I couldn't talk, to be honest. Like my mouth was just, you know, it was a real sort of huge kind of treat because that album was a big old deal. And um, and then he was going and then part of this interview would be he would sort of show me how he some of the recording techniques that he did for Oxygen. And um, the most important one, which sounds sort of so lo fi now, is the main sound in Oxygen, the sort of string sound came from an organ going through a um, guitar effects pedal. And he sort of showed me how that was done. And there was three different of these phaser pedals that he that he sort of used to get this effect and he still and he still had everything from back then so he still had the same effects pedals you know that he'd actually used on the album and he could see how excited I was by this and um you know we sort of said goodbye you know and he was you know he's so sort of lovely and about a week after I came home there was a box in the post and that was in it <laughs> oh, <that's so> strong. <laughs> Show me Show Michel's effect. effects pedal. Yeah, that you made oxygen with. That's amazing. Yeah. Which presumably you have pressed into service. It's I have actually used it, yeah. I'm a bit scared of using it because it's you know, because of sort of what it is. I, I spend most of the time just sort of like looking at it up on the shelf there. But <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. 
Yeah. I've got to I've got to switch tack very slightly to to. Uh, uh, I, I read something about you, about Jesus Christ Superstar and your your, your obsession with that record when it came out. It really yeah. interested me too because you had such unusual taste. So yeah. how old were you when you first no, discovered but the thing that? About that album, it's kind of like the War of the Worlds album. It's I I sort of listened to that with headphones, not knowing who Lloyd Webber or Tim Rice were, you know, or you know that there was even like, you know, that it became like a musical. I sort of listened to it like a, you know like you would have. Um, a sort of radio play, yeah, like War of the Worlds, and it was the most, and it is the most scariest thing. You've got these sort of choirs telling someone that they're doomed, and all this kind of stuff. And I've never heard anything like that. And then, then it goes into very authentic sounding, you know, sort of heavy rock. And the Grease uh, Band wasn't it? The Grease Band, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 it was yeah. Joe Cocker and, and all them, yeah. So that was. You know that album is it's it's kind of the scariest album I think I've ever heard, and like nothing else. And I remember when um, the um, Sergeant Pepper box set came out, which I thought was fantastic. And it looked amazing, and I remember sort of looking at that and thinking, well, there should be something like this done with you know the original concept album, the Superstar album. So I, I knew Tim Rice a bit through through the years. And um, and I emailed and said, look, I've just seen this um, Sergeant Pepper box set and it looks great. And I think there's no reason why, you know, this couldn't be done with, you know, your superstar album. And then he was like, um, are you free for lunch next week? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yep, yeah, I'll come. So I came and met him and his son Donald and I'd, I'd sort of like made a few notes as to, you know, what would be fantastic, you know, if it included this, this and this. And um, scroll on, it's coming out the week after next, I think. I was going to say, because it's 50 years, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so we're slightly late with the 50th due to the whole kind of COVID thing. Right. But, um, it does come out. It contains a lot of the stuff that I've sort of collected over the years photographs of and um yeah so brilliant it was great you know it was kind of great to be part of that yeah. and to, it's such an unusual yeah. thing to have felt so obsessive well, about I'm were you ever in, were about. you ever in a production or anything like that at no, school no, or no, college because no. a lot of people no. were weren't they yeah no 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 i was no i was never no i wouldn't have put myself sort of forward like that when i was at school nor after right <laughs> A war so, of the worlds. That's a, that's that's a that's an unusual thing too. With, well, it's uh, the same effect, the, really. The chances of anyone coming from Mars were a million to one, they said, but still they came. Yeah, yeah. David Essex, Phil Lynott, wasn't it? Yeah. Herbie Flowers. Yeah. Oh, of course, of course. So, how do you you know do, how do you manage to balance you know your you, your sort of TV comedy? work and your music work is that is that a happy balance between the two or it's, would, i mean would, it is it is it is for you know i mean it is for me it's not for the people that i have to work with you know um i mean i say that i mean it's not as bad now but yeah i mean i you know i i want to spend equal time doing both um i sort of drifted into comedy i had no plan to do that um and then when i did do it i loved it and wanted to continue to do it but it was never a plan to do any of that stuff and um and i was just really lucky you know that i got the opportunity 20 odd years ago you know to you know to sort of get into all that but you know it was never a huge ambition you know or, you know or like a plan um you know i mean like i say you know i knew that i wanted to work in the arts and i'd have been kind of happy with any of the arts really um, right. Yeah, but you know, when I'm late for a read through or something because I have to wait for something to be mastered, whoever is doing the other thing is always irritated. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. so, so when you get up in the mo in the morning, is it is music the first thing that you you kind of doing really? Well, it is now because I'm scoring the new series of Toast. So I've just done a fight scene, which um, has taken like three days of um, trying to work out, there's a scene where a 
kick Ray Purchase in the balls, and you see it from bet- sort of between his legs. You see the foot kind of come right. up. Yeah. And it was kind of working out what sort of sound musically and all those <laughs> things. <laughs> and uh, I think I've got there. I don't know. <laughs> how long is that piece of music? So you sit down, right? I mean, how long is it, the fight scene? Uh, the fight scene's about 15 seconds, which is actually quite a long time. <laughs> So this is um, three days you were saying you were constructing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because every because there's, I don't know, there must be about a hundred sort of punches, and it's just kind of working out which ones you want to kind of flag and which ones aren't as important, and all that sort of stuff. Because it's right. you know it's just a rare thing in comedy that something is scored like that, and that's why I kind of want to do it just, you know, cause it's, you don't often sort of see it and it's just, it's just kind of good fun to do. You know, if you watch a fight, you know, in a comedy and then you're suddenly aware that it's like a James Bond fight where every smack is kind of, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You, you, you know, that's not something that you sort of often see, which is kind of why I, you know, I'm kind of keen to do it. Right. Right. There's, there, is there a, a box set of your work? Is this something? There is that... coming out, yeah. At right. The of, at the end of the year. It's called it's called Gather Up. Right. Um, I don't know much else about it than that. Um, yeah, so it's the first sort of 10 years of Acid Jazz in one box set. Right, right. Um, yeah, which is, it's good, you know, because it kind of, it kind of means that I can now do some other stuff. Yeah, sure. With it's, it's traditional on these interviews. We finish by asking people to tell us what's the greatest record ever made. Do you have an answer to that question? Is it something we've seen already? You may have a whole lot of stuff you haven't shown us. Actually, have you got any more sleeves there you haven't shown us? Yeah, I got. Yeah. Oh, go on, get them out. Oh, we, then, 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 let's, let's hear those first. Okay. So I'll put that one there. Is that being the best one? I should show you that. At the end. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then here's a bunch of stuff. That All right. Love. We've got Miles Davis, the instrumental, the funky. Big fun. Is that what it's called? No, what a sleeve. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Full Circle by Forrest. Oh, good grief. I don't think I know Forrest. Forrest. I don't no, you, go, you, go back. Are you go back. across Forrest? <laughs> Joe, that's it. That's cool. Okay. That's a, that's a new one that, on me. You need to get on it. Forest. What else about what, Forest? What, what, what I don't know anything about them. What label's that one? Oh, is that on Harvest? EMI. Right. Okay. Uh, what are they? Oh, what, God, that's Atkinson. a great record. Morrison. Do you know, I was only trying to find that the other day. I've got a copy of that record, Matt. It's brilliant. It's so good. And you can't, I don't think you get it anymore. No. I don't think you get it in any shape or form. I don't think you it? can. This is the, you know, uh, of course. Oh, yeah, fabulous. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's a huge one for me. The organization. Yeah. God, yeah. well, Ray Manzarek must have been a bit of a figure for you if you were a. If... He was. Yeah, yeah. Simon What's Garfunkel, that? that not being Simon or Garfunkel. Is that um, true? <laughs> that was at a the time they weren't speaking to each other. So these two are, these two are lookalikes. <laughs> 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 Is that true? What's the name of the album? Yeah, it's fantastic. Is it called The Collection, I think, or something like that, isn't it? Eric, an Eric Satie album, huge fan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Jimmy Smith. All right, of yeah. course. Another album player. Uh, this is another one that I bought at the time. Big fan of that. Uh, of course, Two Way Army. All Who right. was so, he was cruelly duffed up at the time, wasn't he, Gary Newman? Oh, he's had, the press he's were the obsessed last. with the one. involved in that? Yes. <laughs> no, yeah, I know, but nobody took him seriously. The kind of android, alienated figure. All people uh, talked about was is what he wore on stage. But actually, I mean, yeah, he's had the last laugh. He's he? had the last laugh. He had the no, last laugh. No. There's um, M- um, Mark Ronson's documentary about synthesizers. Um, yeah. He obviously talks to talks to Gary Newman and all of those articles that you both would have been involved with, I'm sure. All kind of splashed up on the screen. Who is this idiot? Why am I, you know, and all this kind of? Oh stuff. well, we were on Smash It, so we were very soft about it. But we very yeah. lightly took the piss. But oh, no, yeah. God, the music press were all about. It. And then his retaliation was to remind you how successful he was. 
you know, his whole thing was, yeah, yeah you may laugh, but you know, it's a bit like James Blunt. But actually, you know, I'm, you know, I'm mortgage free and I'm flying airplanes. And that. that made it worse, actually. Well, I mean, like, it pounded and, his misery. Uh, Paul Bloke was only like 21. So yeah, I know. He wouldn't have known, you know, kind of how to react to any of that. <laughs> but, yeah. And there's obviously this one. Of course, War of the Worlds. Superstar. There you go. Yeah. Sign is Sign. that signed by Tim Rice? By Lord Lloyd Webber and right. Tim Rice. Very and good. Oxygen. Oh, oh yeah, lovely. there you go. Yeah, Oxygen. that's fantastic. Very good. But the, to answer your question, the, go on, the greatest record of all time, in my opinion. Yeah, that's fine. That's all it takes. There you go. Is that quadraphonic I'm looking at? Has that got a? Yes. Have you got a quad set up? No. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever met the elusive uh, Mike no. Oldfield? No. Would that? But would you be overcome if you if you did? Possibly, but I, you know, there's some things you just don't want to kind of, you know, you don't want to kind of mess with. There's some, yeah, yeah, that, you know, that you enjoy as, you know, as a sort of human being. You don't need to lift the curtain, so to speak. Right. But he's, I, I love the idea that he was a role model because, I mean, on your the Blue Elephant record, you played all the instruments in, apart from drums. Was it 19 instruments or something? Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, kind of mostly down to lockdown because they couldn't meet anyone else. But, um, well, no, you know, and I do like to play everything, really. So, yeah. I think, you know, that is obviously a, a reaction. Yeah, yeah. Right. So what's next? Well, the the well, more filming. Yeah, yeah. Um, back to do more vampire stuff till the end of the year. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> what a lovely way to make a living. It beats work, <laughs> isn't it? Does TV it's themes a, and vampires? It's great. Most it's great. people would consider that a holiday. Absolutely, yeah. terrific. No, I know, no, no. I am. Do you know? I, I. There isn't a day goes past, you know, when I'm not kind of thankful. You're right. Because it could have easily have gone the other way and I could have ended up doing something, you know, that I didn't want to be doing. No, I'm acutely aware of that fact, you know, and remind myself every hour almost. Yeah, no, very, very lucky. Well, look, Matt, it's been lovely talking lovely to, to you. Lovely to talk to you. Um, I was going to ask you two something. Um, I go on. Firstly, the 1971... Um, Series on Apple is fantastic. Right. I've got to say, it's, you know, that's down to you. Well, it's not... Have you seen it yet, Dave? Well, it's down to Dave. Have you seen uh, it yet, Dave? I haven't seen it. <laughs> no, you have. <laughs> you haven't seen it. It is so good. It's so well done. Brilliant. Yeah. Good. Good. You know, and the book's fantastic, obviously. Well, thank you very much. It's very kind of you to say. I was going to ask you do, you, do you both get much voiceover work? <laughs> I'll tell you, for, Mark will tell you a funny story that dates back to absolutely years ago when I got called. Now I'll tell the first bit of the story. I got called by an advertising agency. This would be about 1982 or something like this. Said we'd like, and we were to, sharing an office at the time. Do you remember? The we'd phone like rang you, and you answered. We'd, like, yeah. we'd like you to audition. We, 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 we'd like you to test for a commercial. And I thought, in those days, I just assumed that's Tom Corcoran, director on the whistle test, practical joke. That has got to be a practical joke. But no, they kept ringing and they kept ringing. And so eventually I gave them a tape or something like that. And then they eventually came back and said, no, it's not you we want. It's Mark Ellen. Mark and that's Ellen. been the story of our life <laughs> it was ever so since. And I'll tell you who it was for. It was for Martini. Oh, fantastic. And they basically, someone had said, the guy you want is the guy on the whistle test, meaning the guy with the slightly posh voice, not the guy from Yorkshire. And they just got the wrong one. And I went along to the thing. I can still remember it. I've still got the script, as they call it. And it yeah. just says at the top, it says, Martini Bianco, the script, it says. And so the script was, Martini Bianco, the right one. Yeah, and it's the only voice that I've ever done. And I thought it was absolutely hilarious. You will, you will know all about this. So yeah, I sat yeah, there for well, no, 45 I was, I was, minutes yeah, in the studio was. with this guy going, a, a little bit more colour, a little bit more energy. And I was yeah. just going, Martini Bianco, yeah. the right one. You no, know, when, when it's uh, a it was script, yeah, then you yeah. have to, you know, a million different times. for them And to... then the exciting thing at the end is that they are in a little studio with a little screen and they showed you the advert. Which yeah, I can yeah. remember now was a girl in a bikini coming up, shot from above, bouncing off a springboard and into a swimming pool. At the bottom of the swimming pool was the Martini logo. And it had my voice on the ad. I thought, that sounds great. But I didn't get the job. 
I think it was oh, Tommy Vance, Dave, I think. Got oh, really? <laughs> but you've done a huge amount of that with your fabulous, well, rich, fruity tones. Well, I was speaking to a friend of mine, um, Lewis McLeod, who does a lot more voiceovers than I do. He does pretty much all of them. And um, <laughs> I mentioned you two, and you know, we both, you know, those two have incredible voices. Both, oh, like, I don't want to say old school, but you know what I mean. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's such a it's such a rare sort of gift now that you should be doing all of the voiceovers. I'm more than happy <laughs> to hand, hand it all over to you two because, yeah, you have very very distinctive sort of voices, very good. Uh, you know, yeah. comfortable feeling voices is what they. What do. are the products that you think we should be associated with? <laughs> do them all. <laughs> do them all. We do. Uh, <laughs> well, I've seen they're starting to advertise these um, erectile dysfunction things. <laughs> there you go. Oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> so, I knew the moment I asked you, I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> No, but we that still, we yeah. still just uh, uh, rarely a week goes by when Mark doesn't get an approach that actually is actually for me, and I don't get an approach that's actually for Mark because people go. just think we're the people just think they but we're, we're stopped in the street and just called by the other person's name, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. astonishing. We wanted there to do is. this. We wanted to do this live uh, live tour where it was it was David Hepworth and Mark Ellen's one man show, <laughs> which we I always thought was fun. quite a good gag. Really. It's very fun. It is good. Well, yeah. uh, well, we'll we shall, we shall wait for the phone to ring with the immensely lucrative voiceover work. Uh, but we'll, meanwhile, we'll get on with other things. Yeah, we will. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.